In the last 10 years, China has undertaken one of the most ambitious projects the world has ever seen. A project so vast that it touches every corner of the world. In total, $1.3 trillion has been spent in over 140 countries, building everything from high-speed rail networks to huge hydroelectric dams. This is the Belt and Road Initiative, China's vision to cement its influence and power across the world through a series of massive investment projects. But things aren't exactly going to plan. What you are looking at is the unfinished China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a project which was introduced with an eye-watering budget of $60 billion. Similarly, Kazakhstan launched the Korgos Gateway Dry Port for over $9 billion, a project deemed to be almost entirely unnecessary by experts. These billion-dollar mega-projects pop up all over the world, and they are not limited to developing nations. Montenegro, Greece, and even Italy have all taken billions of dollars from China to launch these ambitious projects. And they all have one thing in common. They're all either unfinished, massively over budget, or completely abandoned. To make things worse, many of the countries which happily took the loans are now struggling to pay them back. Of the initial loans, it is estimated that more than a quarter have failed, which means that China has had to hand out over $240 billion in bailout fees. The Belt and Road Initiative was intended to be the centerpiece of Xi Jinping's foreign policy. But what was once dubbed the project of the century has now become the failure of the century. So let's take a look at what the Belt and Road Initiative is, why it went wrong, and what it now means for China. It's worth noting that not every BRI project has been a complete failure. While many are way over budget or simply not feasible, some have been able to bring about some benefit, creating jobs and investment for the local host country, like the forest city residential complexes in Malaysia. But as time has gone on, the bleak realities of many of these projects has come to light. The Belt and Road Initiative started in 2013 as a grand plan to extend China's influence across the world with two elements, the belt and the road. The belt focused on connecting China to Central Asia and Europe by land, weaving through countries like Kazakhstan and Ukraine. And the road, rather confusingly, is the development of sea routes and infrastructure to Southeast Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Contrary to popular opinion, many of the belt and road projects were underway or in discussion before the program's official start date. This is as the term belt and road was more of a marketing ploy used to band all these projects together. Despite the term, the majority of these projects have been within the energy sector. This has come down over subsequent years, but in 2020, the amount of money invested into energy was still around 40%. The contracts would usually work something like this. A country would sign up to have a new energy or transport investment, and along with this, Chinese firms would be handed contracts to design and build the projects, with Chinese workers coming from China to complete construction before returning back home. Whilst the term Belt and Road makes it seem like these projects are all part of a carefully selected strategy for the future, the reality is a series of projects scattered across the globe without a central vision or plan, which has inevitably caused some problems. To understand why China would undertake such an ambitious infrastructure project across five continents, you need to first appreciate the project's ancient predecessor, the Silk Road. For much of recorded history, China was one of, if not the world's largest and most advanced economy. Early innovations in agriculture and manufacturing meant that many of China's goods were highly sought after worldwide. This led to the establishment of the Silk Road, a trade route which connected China with Asia, Africa, the Middle East and Europe for well over one and a half thousand years. This brought not only vast amounts of wealth into China, but allowed them to spread their influence across the globe long before the days of modern communication and transport methods. But by the 18th century, many European nations began to industrialize, and more and more influence and power shifted away from China. Fast forward a couple of hundred years later to 2013, and China's leader, Xi Jinping, wants to relive this legacy and a great source of pride with the Belt and Road Initiative. This is perhaps the reason for the BRI which is cited most, to extend China's power and influence across the globe. As China's economy and seat at the global table has continued to grow, 
they've wanted to develop strategic relationships with countries across the world through the use of funds and loans. Much like the US launched the Marshall Plan across Europe following the Second World War, this is particularly relevant in the energy sector, as the biggest beneficiaries of Chinese BRI loans have been Russia, Qatar and Malaysia, all countries with vast amounts of natural resources. And by forming these connections, China is aiming to ensure its access to these crucial materials going forward. The second reason is that China needs a use for the trillions of dollars it has amassed from American companies. A large part of China's global rise and success has been its role as the world's factory, at some point producing goods or parts for almost every company in the world. This export-driven growth in its boom period has meant that the Chinese central bank has amassed trillions of dollars in foreign currency reserves, and infrastructure projects abroad were viewed as a smart way to use this money. The third and less talked about reason is to combat the overcapacity in China's economy. China's growth has given it an enormous amount of productive capacity, but a general slowdown in the world economy and a slight shift away from China in recent years means that many Chinese firms do not have enough demand for their massive workforce or productive capabilities. This has been an issue particularly in sectors such as steel, cement, aluminium and construction materials, which helps to explain why it has taken on a number of infrastructure projects which can provide work for these industries. The idea was that through these set of projects, China could address all these problems at once. In one fell swoop, China can expand its influence overseas, use its foreign exchange reserves, and utilize its companies, all whilst generating return on its loans to these countries. But what started as a massive success quickly became a massive problem for China. Lots of commentators and economists have said that it has been clear for a while that China has massively overextended itself stating the eye-watering levels of debt that they've racked up can't be good for their economy. If you also felt like this, then you would like the sponsor of our video today, Kaoshi. Kaoshi is the first legal exchange in the US that allows you to trade on any event, from economics to geopolitics and many more markets. Instead of investing in stocks, you can now trade on events that you care about. If you think that China's trillion dollar lending is going to cause an economic downfall, then you can trade on their GDP or inflation rate. Or do you think that TikTok could be forced to sell in the US? You can also trade on that. Kaoshi's user-friendly platform and regulated markets make this easier than ever. You can sign up using my link at kaoshi.com forward slash the invisible hand and the first 500 traders will get a free $20 credit when they deposit $50. In the last decade, China has been eager to establish their overseas presence and in their haste to form connections, China has been lending to hundreds of countries and now faces a real risk of not being paid back. So how did it all go so wrong? Given the nature of China's media censorship and general closed-off view, it can be hard to find specific details about many of the projects on the initiative. But what we do know is that they have undertaken thousands of projects in over 150 countries, seemingly without many checks or balances in place. This presents the first major issue with the BRI. A lot of the countries which were lent to were classified as developing or emerging nations, meaning that they were not wealthy and would not ordinarily have the money to take out vast infrastructure projects like rail and road networks. So China stepped in and provided the money with relatively few questions asked. You see, when a loan to a developing nation is issued, it's usually by a body like the IMF, and it's accompanied by a whole host of conditions. Feasibility checks, anti-corruption measures, environmental regulations, to name a few. For a lot of developing countries, this is a tedious process, and at the end, there is still no guarantee that they will get the money. China, however, presented an alternative, offering large amounts of money without the need for these background checks. All you had to do was agree to their payment terms. These were usually half the length and double the interest rates of typical IMF loans. These indiscriminate loan terms meant that very quickly, hundreds of countries across the world signed up for loans, and Chinese companies started to set up shop in Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America to begin production. But quite quickly, cracks started to appear. This graph here shows the average credit rating, essentially the risk of default or not being paid back on Chinese loans to emerging economies. Initially, we can see that it starts off at around the average, but since the beginning of the Belt and Road in 2013, 
As time has gone on, this has continued to fall further and further away from the average, and most of China's loans are now nearing junk status, essentially meaning that they have a very low chance of being paid back. The poor loan selection process becomes abundantly clear when we look at the list of China's largest lenders as part of the BRI. Just at a glance, countries like Turkey and Egypt stand out for receiving around $100 billion in loans each. And both are countries in a poor state economically, with Egypt nearing the brink of financial collapse. Issues aren't just with China's loans to emerging countries, but also to developed ones. This shows the percentage of total Chinese loans to countries in distress, such as those fighting in a war or asking for a restructuring. At the BRI's induction, this started at a manageable 5%. Sanctions against Venezuela in 2014 started to push this up, but only to around 20%, which was deemed to be a reasonable level. However, in the last five years, this has rapidly increased. The pandemic has meant that many developing countries had to close down their economies and increased spending on things like furlough schemes, placing a lot of strain on their economy. This has meant that many countries didn't have enough capital to make their repayments. And now thanks to the Russian war in Ukraine, the total amount of loans in distress is around 60%. With the total exposure of the BRI so far around $1.3 trillion, this means China now faces the possibility of $780 billion of its loans not being paid back. To put that into perspective, that's roughly the size of the entire Swiss economy, and it's more than twice the amount of the most heavily indebted firm in the world, Chinese construction company Evergrande. But the issues with the BRI aren't simply down to poor timing. Project selection has been woefully poor. This is perhaps best highlighted with the Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka. After the United States and India chose to turn down the project as it wasn't deemed feasible, China decided to swoop in to provide funding. This started like many other Belt and Road projects, where millions of dollars and Chinese firms flooded in to begin construction. However, in 2017, Sri Lanka became unable to continue making its loan repayments, and the port had to come under the ownership of the Chinese on a 99-year lease. This project was surrounded by corruption allegations, as Chinese officials became large donors of the then-president's election campaign. This is just one of the many hastily selected projects that has ended up either unfinished or surrounded by corruption, bribery or labor violation allegations. And according to the World Bank, around 35% of all BRI projects have been struck with one of these issues. As the realities of the Belt and Road Initiative have started to come to life, China has started to significantly reduce the amount of lending it's sending to other nations. Here we can see the net flow of money between China and Belt and Road countries, and see that after 15 years of heavy outflow, China is now starting to demand repayment on its loans, as well as halting their outflow. After years of sending out loans, we are entering the period where China should be sitting back and watching the repayments come in. But as we have seen, much of this money is at risk. So China now faces two options pour more money into these projects in an attempt to get them to a point where they're profitable, or it cuts ties with these countries and stops the cash flows. As a consequence, many of these projects will likely become abandoned as they simply cannot be afforded by their host nations. Whatever China decides on, it's not in a good state economically, and its endeavors abroad look likely to end up in a similar way to those happening at home, with heavily indebted property developments. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to point fault in the plan and see how China massively overstretched itself. But at the time, this wasn't the case. In fact, many Western powers were heavily criticized for not taking on similar projects, essentially allowing China to overtake it as being the go-to power in regions like Africa and Central Asia. There's no doubt that the BRI has helped to promote China's image as a global power on the world stage. But if this starts to go wrong, then this reputation could easily be reversed, and with rising interest rates and a general downturn in the global economy expected, it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. Thanks again for Kaoshi for sponsoring today's video. You can find the details on how to get set up in the description. And if you've liked this video and want to watch more, then make sure to subscribe.